Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Schmidt from the University of Salzburg as a speaker today. He will speak on the stability of objective structures. So Ben uh, got his PhD from the University of Leipzig. He was a student of Stefan Mel in the Max Planck Institute. So he graduated in 2006. Yes. Then he moved to uh, Caltech for a year. Yeah. And then uh, he spent postdoc and assistant professorship at the Technical University of Munich. And from 2011, he is a professor in Alburg, applied mathematics. So I think for his PhD thesis, he earned a photo handed out of the Max Planck Society. And then also he was awarded by the, by the Richard von Jesus Prize from the German uh, Society for Applied Mathematics and Mechanics, it was 2009. So his research interests are applied mathematics, multi scale problem, elasticity, also the script to continue passages. I think this is the topic he will talk today. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for this very kind introduction and uh, uh, also for the possibility to be here. It's a big honor to give a lecture in this uh, in, in your seminar. Um, I'm going to present some. Uh, recent work and uh, joint work with um, a former PhD student of mine, um, Martin Steinbach, uh, who and the most clever ideas in this talk are due to Martin, of course. Um, um, and uh, uh, Ian very unfortunately left science. So um, uh, I, I don't have to choose it. Now, here's uh, my, my brief outline. I first uh, talk a little bit about lattices in order to familiarize everybody with something you probably don't, uh, all know. Then I will talk about objective structures, and I will not assume that you know a priori what objective structures are. And then we will go a little bit more in the mathematics of uh, how to measure deviations from the equilibrium of such uh, atomistic atomic structures. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about the general um, a general method to, to check if such, an, if such a structure is in fact a stable object, if it is it's a stable configuration in space. And then I will apply this uh, to the example of a carbon nanotube. Okay, so um, here is what I think you probably all know very well. So this is a lattice. And for the sake of discussion, let's take the easiest Fabre lattice, let's take Z to the D. And let's assume we have these. Um, uh, sites of atoms and these uh, particles on these sites uh, interact via some potential. Now, the potential uh, depends is on some, this is the sum over all the project or over all the interactions a point X might have with its neighbors. So this is the point X and these X plus rho are all of its neighbors and uh, R can be a general neighborhood structure. And then we look at this finite difference theme, uh, stencil here and this defines the discrete gradient, and this should be what we consider to be the energy of the particle system. Now, um, this is in some sense formal because we don't really know if it converges or not. So here, for example, this is the interaction of the atom X with all its neighbors and, and next nearest neighbor, even in this example. Uh, so let's, for the sake of discussion, first make it finite by looking at a very large but finite box and may, maybe for the time being applying some uh, um, periodic boundary conditions. Yeah? Then we can talk about the energy per atom and this is exactly this, this expression here. What we would like to know if, is if this structure here, the regular lattice is in equilibrium or if it wants to lower energy. So if this is, sta if this is a stable configuration or not. Um, and if you want to check this, there's an easy, easy check. You just uh, make a second order test. So it should be stable if, um, so this is the derivative. So take, let's assume you have the first derivative equal to zero. And so you're at a critical point here, you're at a critical point. And then we look at this K, which is just the Hessian at the identity. If you put Y equal the identity, then this is just what's what's happening here. And then you uh, take the infimum over this quadratic expression by this, by this norm here, and you minimize over all the points here. Now, if this is positive, then you would call this stable. 
Now, the, the point is, of course, this might depend on n. Yeah. So if n gets very large, instabilities could develop from some very long wavelength uh, approximation or uh, perturbations, I should say. So um, I would call this, if this is true for fixed and finite stability criterion, but um, in atomistically stable, I would talk, um, I, I would say if uh, this, um, is even true for all n if, there's, if, the, if the infimum is even lower bound uh, at the positive by a positive number uh, as n is very large. Now, this is of course a bit intrinsic. How do we quantify this? Well, we're on a finite, on, on a lattice, on a peri periodic lattice. So we could just try to, to co compute this quantity by taking Fourier transform. Yeah? So let's do this. Let's introduce Fourier transform, which in this finite setting then lives on this dual lattice here. But on this dual group, I should say. Um, so, which is also now um, like a discrete torus, but, uh, but uh, with positions one over n here. And then this is by definition in the Fourier transform. Um, so, we do the Fourier transform. Why do we do the Fourier transform? Because if we have this finite differences here, these, these discrete gradients, then this quantity here, the session just diagonalizes in the Fourier picture. And in the Fourier picture, you can get this quantity here, um, and um, you can rather write down it explicitly. Don't look at this. It's just to, this line is just uh, as the only only sense to to show you that uh, this uh, is explicit. Then we can write in this form. Now, if we do this, um, then it's um, not not so hard to show that somehow this atomistic stability constant that I de defined before, where you really take the infimum over all n, is uh, nothing but uh, just given by the smallest eigenvalues of this guy here. Um, and there is some, some normalizing constant here if you, if you need to solve all the right way. Now, just to, 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 to have a remark, how does this compare to the usual criteria that you know? So if, for example, you go from, from discrete to continuum by some Cauchy-Born approximation, you have some smooth um, perturbations where so where each ad atom follows individually, it's a very smooth uh, perturbation, then this would be exactly what happens at very low wavelengths or very small wave numbers here. So this, this uh, Legendre Hadama, um, stability constant that belongs to this associated continuum problem would just be only only will only see what happens at very small wave numbers and here the atomic stability has to go has to take infinity or all, all these all these things. Now that's basic lattice stability. Now let's go to something more complicated. I would like to discuss the the object of objective structures. So objective structures is something that a couple of years um, um, Dick James uh, from, from Minnesota has invented in order to generalize the idea of Bravais lattices. So what is a Bravais lattice? A Bravais, a Bravais lattice is if you sit on a point and you look around and see all the other atoms, you see exactly the same environment from every point. And you see, not only you see exactly the same environment, but if you go to another position, uh, you, you, you just have a translation of what you see, right? Now, a discrete set of atoms which sees the same picture, but not modular translations, but say after a coordinate change, after an isometry is called an isometric, uh, is called uh, um, uh, an, an objective structure. So here's a typical example of a carbon nanotube. If you sit on this atom here, it looks exactly the same as if you look on this, uh, up to a rigid coordinate change. That is by definition an objective structure. Now there's a good theoretical um, way to describe it. And uh, that's this one here. So an objective structure is nothing but the orbit of a discrete subgroup of the group of isometries of um, R to the D. So the group of isometries acts on Rd by multiplying with an orthogonal matrix plus some, uh, plus some translation. And uh, if you take a single point and take the orbit of this, this is what you get out. You get it, so that's, that's, that's not so hard to, to see. Um, now, there's a special case, which is pretty interesting. This is when uh, the group is sort of very big in each dimension. Yeah? And in this case, this has an own name. This goes under the name of, oh, well, sorry. It goes under the name, or well, still here, I can also leave it like this, of a space group. 
So a space group is one of these groups G, which has the linear independent translations. And this means you invade the whole. Uh, ah, thanks. So it means it invades, if you look at the orbit of a single point, it basically invades the whole space. Yeah, it becomes, uh, it, it, it sees, it, it, it goes with this. Not so in this example here, for example, here you have just one elongated direction and it does not invade the whole space. Well, there's in fact a general structure of these groups. So a discrete subgroup can be always written, it can be identified uh, as uh, by, uh, by this, as being a subgroup of, uh, you can split the whole space R to the D in two subspaces, R to the D1 and R to the D2, up to changes of coordinates, where you have a finite range in this space. So in this case, this would be like these lateral dimensions. And you have, um, so it is uh, only um, a subgroup of the orthogonal matrices here. And here you have a full space group, but the space group is in a lower dimensional setting. So for a carbon nanotube, D1 would be two and in, in three space, and D2 would be one, which would be this elongated direction. So what we know is then, uh, so basically this is true, and it's even like this, that if you project only onto the, the second part, of this is subjective on, on the space group here. If you did this here, you projected everything onto the same, then you get a space group in one dimension, which is more or less uh, a translation plus a little bit. I will come back to this. Now, what to keep in mind is when you look from very, very far apart onto such an objective structures, what you will see is something which is fills D2 dimension of space and is very, very thin in the um, orthogonal space, which is uh, uh, which has the dimension D1. Okay, so um, now let's try to do some math and, and let's try to, to well, at the end, I'm, I'm heading towards some Fourier um, uh, analysis on such, such objects. Now, what is a bit difficult is that in these general groups, we don't have translations and translations is very nice if you want to do Fourier transforms because then you can, easy, can, can correct, have, have easy characters and stuff. You don't have, have all this, but what we do have is we do have a surrogate of translations, and this is the following. In this smaller group, S here, that's a space group. This, there we have a lot of translations, namely D, at least D2 uh, linear independent translations. So what we can do is we can take the translation group of this guy here and see uh, this way and see if we cannot find a set of T, which are sort of translations in the bigger group. Well, in such case, the only requirement is if I project onto the second component, it should be a translation. So in some sense, I'm taking a section of translations of the translation group in the big group. This has some disadvantages because um, uh, this is not unique. And uh, in fact, it's some, uh, there are situations where you cannot even do it in such a way that T becomes a group. But nevertheless, we can choose it. And uh, the basic observation that we can make then is then if we take the kernel of this representation uh, of this uh, projection onto the second part here, um, and we have this T times the kernel, then we get, a, uh, get again a nice, even normal subgroup of G. And uh, in fact, it will turn out that this is finite index and that uh, this is exactly as taking uh, the um, as, as, as taking the um, the quotient group of, of the smaller space group in the two dimension uh, by its own translations. Now, it is not a group itself, but it turns out that you can take powers of it. So this t to the n denotes all elements that I can write as a little t to the n for some t in, 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 in t. So all the m powers. And this, in fact, if you choose m appropriate, appropriately, turns out to be a normal subgroup. And we will take exactly these normal subgroup in order to, 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 to define the define solutions. Okay. Now then, of course, you have something very nice. You have, uh, you have basically a group which is which is uh, which which are translations. Now, okay. Now this is our surrogate now for the translations. Now, if we have or even t raised to some suitable power, if if we need. So this gives us the possibility to define what is an periodic displacement or a periodic 
um, deformation on an a priori not periodic object like um, like these objective structures simply by this. So we say a function on G is periodic if um, this periodicity relation holds true. And then what well, we say is TN periodic. Now this is a, not yet a good definition because as I said above, T, um, the choice of T is not unique as is, 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 is not straightforward. But it turns out if we say that a function is periodic with respect to some TN, then in fact, we get a good notion because this is indeed in the, uh, independent. Okay, now, and if we have now uh, sets of periodic functions, then we can easily introduce um, a sort of a measure on a sort of a two space by just saying, well, this should be the true norm of a periodic function if it's T and periodic. Now, this C is just the representation set of, uh, of this, this guy here, of uh, this group. Okay, now, uh, once we have this, we can now try to deform these configurations. Um, how do we do this? Now it turns out, so basically you want, this is the atomic, uh, the, the objective structure, you want to deform it. So this point should be mapped somewhere, but the point here just sees what is G. So I just need to see how it acts on G. And the idea is um, to, to write in a kind of this group displacement form. Yeah, because if you have like this, uh, this structure here, here's the identity, here's G times the identity, and you don't well, you want to see what is the displacement here. It's good to first transport it back to the identity, say what is the uh, displacement here, and then transport the displacement back to this. So these guys become more easily comparable to each other, right? So, but this I can always write like this. So this is what I, this is the actual physical uh, um, uh, space where it's mapped to, and then this is the associated group displacement and so on, uh, to uh, related to this. Thing. Okay, now then I do have an energy, and an energy could be a pair interaction, but like, like we had for lattices. So, like for lattices, we take a sum now for periodic. We only need to take a sum over these representatives of the periodic uh, point of the, of, the, of, the, of the periodicity. And then we look at all these uh, finite difference senses, and here, um, I hear it's the most general form. So H can really vary. It could be R here, but now I don't uh, G without identity. So we can hide this in the in the V again if we only have a finite range of interactions. Yeah. And so this is the most general energy that you could write down for, for such an for such an expression. Okay. Now once we have written this down, then what what what, what is the assumption? Now that's our interaction potential. I should better, better say that's our on-site potential. Yeah. So if you have um the atom labeled by G, this is all the interactions with the atoms labeled by GH, where H rates runs to the group. And this is the onside potential. It should be uh, frame indifferent, it should it be invariant by rotating these guys, and it should be close to the identity. Yeah. So this is the first, this is the point X naught, and this is the point H times X naught. So all the other atoms, that's what X naught interacts with everybody else. Um, and it should be close in you know, infinity close here, and then also the form that you explain by a frame different you have that it's 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 not a match uh, in, in the neighborhood of the identity. Um, and whenever it's needed later, I will comment on this. I will also assume that in fact the V is zero uh, if the H is too big. Yeah. And what you could think of, for example, would be a Granard Jones type interaction. That would be admissible in this sense. Yeah. Okay. Now um, Now we need to control these guys. Now we want to, what, what, where, where, where am I aiming at? I'm aiming at a stability um, analysis. So in some sense, if I control the energy, I should also control the deformation. That's my, that's my ultimate goal. So, but I cannot control the complete deformation maybe because uh, there are some, some zeros. Uh, so some, some, there could be some soft modes that have very little energy, but large rotation. So for this, uh, reason I'm defining these quantities here. So that's the group of, uh, that's the, if you have, have a subset that you should think of this as a finite subset of, uh, of your structure, like, like a structure right here. So that's a finite subset of, of, of G. And um, then we say the group of translations is, well, the translation is just an infinite, a constant, yeah? This is just an infinitesimal translation or a rotation 
so that this is an infinitesimal rotation. The infinitesimal rotation is just given by, by, by some skew-symmetric matrix. I will, I will write down this, this, this more explicitly later. And the set of uh, uh, linearized isometries is then exactly the set here. Now, let us define what it means to be locally close to an isometric, um, to an isometric uh, um, um, uh, deformation. So we define the following seminorms. That's, that's our displacement. Now we go again over all these uh, representatives of, uh, of, of, um, of, a periodic, of the periodicity. And now we take this test set R, which defines the local, local neighborhood. And then we look in, into U, that transported everything transported to the action position G that we consider. And then we take the orthogonal projection with this kernel. So if this, if, if, if something is a linearized isometry, we don't pay, but uh, the, orthogonal, uh, the orthogonal direction pays, yeah? So we take this orthogonal projection with this kernel and everything else, which is orthogonal to the kernel, we, we, we write into this norm. Okay, let's skip this, Maybe it's all discrete, so you could also do this with gradients, but this doesn't change. But let me stick to this definition. The basic observation is that if uh, R1 and R2 are sufficiently rich, you should, they're finite, they're, they're, they remain finite, and they could be some, some yeah. test size. If they are not too, too small, then in fact, it doesn't matter which I choose because uh, all these, um, all these uh, norms are, are dominant. Okay, now um, let's, Go to now. I'm heading to somewhat like like a core inequality um, because I mean there are these 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 um, these infinitesimal rotations which are local. They are still local there. So I, I could at each position at each g I could have a, a, a different a different um, um, uh, a different um, skew-symmetric matrix. Yeah. So um, let me now write more specifically this u rot. This rotation matrix, it's so that's the linear part, that's the translation part of, of an isometric um, uh, mapping. Um, now, the linear part of this shouldn't be nothing, should be given just by a skew symmetric matrix like this. Okay, and here plus some, you could also do this one. Let's forget this minus x naught. So it should be like a skew symmetric matrix acting on the structure. Okay. Now, Let's take a different seminar where I do exactly the same. I do exactly the same orthogonal projection and I penalize everything which is orthogonal, but now to a smaller space, not to U rot, but to the place, the space U rot, where I, in addition, assume that this S has a zero um, in the lower right corner. Now that's the D2 corner, this is where the, uh, the atomic atomistic uh, construction is extended in, in full space. It invades the whole space down here. Yeah. So in the, but in the nano tube, it's not so interesting because there's a zero anyway. Yeah. But for a plane, it's interesting. For a plane, this would be two dimensional, this lower uh, here, and there could be a non trivial skew symmetric part. But now I'm saying this should be zero. Yeah. So this is now fixed and equal to zero. And then one of the first main theorems um, is the following. Indeed, we do have something like a corner inequality. So in case this R is not degenerately, in a, in a degenerate way small, it's sufficiently rich, but that's, uh, that's uh, not a big deal. Um, then in fact, these norms are equivalent, yeah? Maybe it's easiest to think about space groups. If you think about space groups that invade the whole space, then these upper parts are not there at all. Then S needs to be zero, yeah? So in this case, it's a full corn inequality. The, the previous one was allowed for a different S from lattice side to lattice side. Now I only, with this uh, U rod naught, I only have an S which is equal to zero everywhere for the space group. So this would be a full, a full um, core inequality. In, 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 in lower dimensional structures, it's not a full core inequality, but it's a core inequality in the extended direction. So for example, if you have a plane like this, but it's embedded in three space, like if, like for example, think about uh, um, 
a lattice, a triangular lattice uh, embedded into three space, yeah, then it would say that in this direction here, you know, the skew-symmetric matrix should be zero. Uh, and in fact, one, well, if you prove it, one, one is easy because this subspace is smaller, so this is trivially always bigger. But in fact, to prove this takes takes uh, uh, a lot of time. And you really have to have to go through an analysis of the different wave uh, uh, perturbations that can, have, uh, can, can, can be present in the system. Um, okay, so let's uh, move on. Um, we could try. We could ask for even more. I could. I could uh, um, go on and could ask for an even stronger semi-norm by requiring that also this and this part is equal to zero, but otherwise still exactly the same. Now this would mean that if I have um, like a plane embedded in three space, that in fact, okay, there's always something that can be, I mean, this part is something purely finite. I cannot control this properly, but this would mean that this is also some skew part which goes into the um, in which which enters the, uh, the the part which is not occupied, which which tilts a little bit in this direction. And in fact, it's always trivial to see that this is even even still bigger. But in fact, it need not be equivalent. I have shown an explicit count example a little bit later. Uh, however, it turns out that for our um, stability analysis, this is still an interesting object, and so I will uh, so I have to find it here, and we'll come back to this point a little bit later. In terms of um, a qualitative um, agreement, we are still good. So they, these nodes are not equivalent, but they have the, the same kernel, yeah, in the sense of what is really um, what is really e e uh, mapped to zero. This is exactly this space here, um, where this double node um, is, is the set from before, but with the additional assumption that all these all these guys are equal to zero. Yeah. So qualitatively, this is still um, true, but quantitatively, and we want to have it quantitatively in the end, uh, this is not true any longer. Now, what is stability? Now, stability should be the following. Um, we say a atomistic structure and an objective structure together with its uh, potential V is stable with respect to one norm or the other, the intermediate norm are, are not this well, this was the Korn theorem was uh, was was uh, uh, equivalent. If it is a critical point, and for some constant we have a lower bound like this. Of course, that's what we want to have, because then you put the C on to the other side, and once you control the energy, you have a good control on the deformation. And maybe even here you have an even better control if you have this better uh, this, this better quantity here. This is what we are aiming for. Now, before doing this, now uh, let me first say, uh, say um, let's let's call the best object here um, uh, the stability constant. So the best quantity we can define here, the, the best possible C in this setting should be lambda, um, and atom, atom a refers to atomistic, and the best lambda here should be uh, a lambda a double atom naught. Um, now. And the basic task is not to check if I define it like this, where with zero, with zero it should be true. Uh, if you define it by this, if it's really if it's really positive. Now, before I do this, um, let me say that in fact, not in the full range, but um, at least for certain cases. So d1 equals zero. This means there's no finite part. This is the part. This is the full space group part, or for D1 equals D, this would be the case where the structure is not extended in any direction infinitely long. This would be a finite structure. Like a finite structure could be just the ring of atoms, for example, or it could be uh, the corners of, of an icosahedron, for example, would be, would be another example. So there are a number of finite uh, structures um, which, which can be determined by this. And in, in this case, we have that if we have a finite, um, um, finite stability constant, then in fact, we, we can show that this is even a local minimum with respect to the infinity norm. Now, um, before we do this, let's think if we have chosen the right, um, the right norms by, by proving or trying to prove the opposite direction. 
is it true that our energy, that our hessian of the energy is bounded at least from above by these quantities that we introduce? So uh, this means that do we, do we have really bounds, do we have boundedness of these forms when we, 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 in, uh, when we uh, look at, into these seminomes here? Now, this is a norm. The seminomes will come in a minute. This is a norm. And somehow, this is a very easy estimate here. Yeah, so a very easy, but this is the full finite gradient. And if you write down the energy, then this is, uh, if you do some Taylor expansion, you almost immediately see that you have um, control by the full, by the full gradient. But that's, that's too much on the right hand side. Yeah. So the next question, therefore, is um, can we have something which is, which is bounded from above by a better constant? Now, there's one case which seems almost too good to be true. This is, in fact, I can put here the upper bound, exactly the small seminorm that we defined before, but only in a very, very easy application. So these as what I call equilibrated case. So assume that you're in an energy equilibrium, but not just because the forces are all equal to zero, all net forces are equal to zero, but simply because even each on-site potential is in equilibrium, yeah? So this is this never happens, for example, for the Leonard Jones example, but if you had, for example, a domestic chain, which only nearest neighbor interaction, this would be true, yeah? So that's a very specific situation where each atomistic bond is sort of happy, each on-site potential is individually happy, yeah? In, in such a case, in fact, we do have a very strong bond like this. Now, the general case is a bit more complicated, and we do have a full picture in 3D. In 3D, um, this is a full case separation, and that's why we then stopped at some point. It turns out that if we have um, um, a finite structure, then um, we do have the same good bound for critical points. If we have space groups, D equals D2, then in fact, we have the same good bound, and we call here then for space groups, R naught naught is the same as R naught, so they are all equivalent. And then this is the case of hyperplanes, like a plane in RD embedded in RD. We do have this condition, but only with R naught naught, so with the, with the, the bigger norm here. And uh, this is, the, in our case, the, the, uh, the rod case in, 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 in the in ambient space three. Um, we, we also have this um, if we have positive uh, action here. So this would be like at least in 3D a full picture. And now, of course, the question is, do we find matching lower bounds? Because these are not the upper bounds. The stability constant should be the matching lower bounds. And this is what we, what I'm going to address now. Um, now we have to do some. Uh, we have to we have to check. And what I would like to do is, I would like to give you a check on these quantities, which is really implementable. For um, for a concrete a very concrete given system, and so what we want to do now is we want to describe exactly as for the lattices the stability constants in terms of Fourier of Fourier uh, of Fourier analysis. Now previously we had uh, this minimum eigenvalue over such a fundamental domain of the unit of uh, from zero to two pi um, of this fancy matrix H. Now we have to do it a bit more complicated. Now the, the nice case for the lattice is there's an underlying group structure. This is just the translation, and this is um, this is a, a commutative group. Right? Now for the general case, there's no commutative group, so we have to do a bit more. Uh, a bit, we have to dig a bit deeper into Fourier analysis. But say you can do this. Um, it's uh, let me remind you of what you need to do. Instead of looking just into a dual group, we have to define um, Representations, unitary representations, and these are just group homomorphisms from a group to the set of uh, unitary matrices here. Then you say two such guys are equivalent if they are just um, related by this um, uh, by this uh, equation here. And you say they are irreducible if the only set of they cannot be built of two different blocks if uh, zero and uh, the full space are the only invariant subspaces. And then basically you take uh, of this equivalence class, you take uh, one representative, or you just say, well, the set of equivalence classes, this is my dual object. Now, if you do this, then um, you can um, define Fourier transform. 
Let me, before we do this, let me give you another fact. It turns out that it's a bit hard to handle if, if, to find all these, um, these objects. But we have at our disposal these, these groups that I introduced earlier, the surrogate T and T to the N and stuff. And uh, we can do something, we can use these. Now, here is something which is uh, useful. If you have a subgroup and you have a representation of a subgroup, then you can build it. You can use the subgroup to have an induced representation of the larger group. Um, I'm not explaining exactly what you do. It's in some sense, you shuffle the cosets a little bit. Um, let, me not, let me not go into details what you do here. Um, and so this is, in some sense, gives you the possibility only to look into representations of a smaller group, because then you get back into do, induced representation later. And there's a, a, a theory which basically tells you exactly what's happening. Now, if you have an, even a normal subgroup of H, of finite index, then somehow, and these, um, this mapping here is bijective in some sense. So each row gives an induced representation here, but somehow the same is given by um, H acting on row. So if you have a representation row on a small group, um, if this is a, it's a normal subgroup, then this H also acts on the, on the, on the representations by this formula. And in this way, basically, all you have to remember is that we can quantify all these induced representations basically by this H acting onto, onto those. Now, if we do this, then um, uh, now let's use this somehow. Let's use this. And there's or, already, there's always something easy we can do. So these are the groups, which are basically, this is somehow which, where we can have translations defined. So this is basically, if we map this onto the extended directions R2, then we are back to the, to the space, uh, to, the, to the rotation, sorry, to the translations T in our lower dimensional space group. And on this guy, so here you map it, you map G onto some rotation. So that's uh, onto some translation by, by the vector B. And here, if you define this guy here, then this is something that is just a plain wave, you know, from regular Fourier transform, right? Um, and this would be then defined character. So just a one dimensional representation of this group, which is a subgroup. And we know already it's even a normal subgroup of our group G. Now, this is very good because these are very easy. Let's take a look, let, let's take these and try to build as many representations we can by using these very easy characters. Um, in some sense, we do this uh, here. Yeah, so we say that two representations are equivalent, now not in the previous by, by conjugation, but now in this and a new equivalence uh, notion, if they have the same representation and one is just, um, well, a multiple of such a character versus this other one. And then it turns out that, in fact, if we mod out this equivalence class, there are only finitely many representations. Uh, repre uh, there's only finitely many cosets. So we have, um, so this basically is we have a finite representation set. And in fact, we can even choose um, um, a representation set, which is also a representation set of this guy here, where in addition, I ask that the um, uh, that the uh, representative here is even periodic. This makes it um, uh, algorithmically very uh, easy then to check if I uh, to search for, for a representation set. Okay, and now here we're very close to the main theorem. Um, now, if you have a representation here, then we can again ask ourselves now, um, what does it mean that this guy and this guy are the same, but it turns out that if you fix a rotation here, now we fix rho and see what can what different uh, different representation do we get if we pre-multiply by such, such, such a character, then in fact there is a space group associated to rho of this the small dimension of space. So that basically they're the same as long as they have the same order. Basically, this means we only have to look into a, a fundamental domain of such of such a group. Yeah. So this can be quantified a little bit, and then I'll do this here. And then we do have the main theorem. Now, if we want to know um, what are all these induced representations, we have 
we have to take a representation set P, which is now some finite object, yeah, some finite sets of representations. And to each of them, we associate a fundamental domain, yeah, a fundamental domain of, of this action of the space group. And then we take simply the disjoint union of these. So instead of one fundamental domain that we had for lattices in the first slide, we now have a copy of say five fundamental domains. And then we can write all these guys in this picture here. Yeah, so they all give, uh, so we have complete control that um, all these guys look exactly uh, like here and this row only varies in this finite set here. Okay, now, um, now, now it's getting much more easy again. We can go through this quickly uh, on the um, uh, find uh, periodic functions. You define an inner product like this. And uh, now we define what is a Fourier coefficient in a Fourier uh, transform. A Fourier coefficient is by definition, that's, that's basic group theory, is by definition this. We normalize here by the, by the number of by the periodicity cell. Uh, size and uh, then we define the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform is of, of an L infinity function. Is now take a representation set of e of uh, e of 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 these periodic um, of periodic um, representations, and then we simply map u to this whole array of uh, of Fourier transforms. Now this is a well defined Fourier transform, and notice that this is in fact finite. So, so if, if you use TN periodic, then um, if you have something here which is not TN periodic, then the, then the uh, Fourier coefficient which belongs to it would, would be would, would, would vanish. Now, now let's um, go to the algorithm. Now, what I would like to present at the end is what is the algorithm to determine stability? Now, let's write it in the following. We need to take, we need to check if something is, is a critical point. So let this write now as, as a certain vector. Let's write this quadratic form of mu and phi in terms of some convolution. That's that's good if I want to use Fourier transform. And I can do this by shift invariance. So by shift invariance, I can find, I can write this as a convolution in, in terms of some convolution operator here. And the same by shift invariance of, of uh, the semi norm, I can also introduce this guy here, which is like a convolution representation of this of the semi norm here. Now, what I would like to do is so this is the energy, the stability constant. The stability constant is then nothing else but this, the maximal C, so that this inequality is true. Um, maybe I would skip. Now, let's, well, that's, that's an example I promised earlier. I can only give this now since I have defined Fourier transforms. Um, maybe I'm skipping this and just uh, let it here for five seconds to show that, um, well, I did it wrong. No, that's right. Um, by, by showing you that somehow um, uh, these norms need not be equivalent, but let's not go into this detail now. Now what I uh, now need to compute Somehow this is a kind of, um, yeah, I need to, if I write this now in terms of these quantities here, then I'm sort of solving in basically a generalized eigenvalue problem. So what does it mean? A basic uh, generalized eigenvalue problem is the following. You define, um, you define it like this, the maximal C, so that A is lower bounded by B, and this I would call lambda mean of N, that's just information. Now, um, and here, but this is still an easy representation. Yeah, that's the basically I'm solving, I'm, I need to solve the lambda min of this guy with respect to this and rho varying over all the representations. And now the theorem is that in fact, it's sufficient to do this for all these um, um, uh, induced representations, basically. So you have a lambda and you still, what you need to do is you need to compute these quantities here and then you need to in, in the end check if it's finite. Now there's now a nasty slide coming, which you should not read in detail, but it's just showing you that this is purely algorithmic. I will go, I will just browse through it. So this is just maybe read the red parts. So what we need to do is we need to calculate this energy. This is, can be simply done by computing this derivative. You need to write this guy here, which can be done by computing the derivative of V. 
they need to compute this guy, which can also be done algorithmically, and they need to find a representation set P. I will give you an example later. And then you need to associate uh, the, the fundamental domains of this space loop, which belong to this guy here. And then you need to determine all these into induced representation. And then you simply check if in the end it's positive. Now, let's do this in one example. Let's do it for the initially uh, shown uh, carbon nanotube. So that's a carbon nanotube. And the geometry is like this. It's an, it's an um, objective structure. I'm starting here. And then I have one T. T goes like a rotation in, X, in, in its Y direction. And it moves step A in Z direction here. So this is T. So the E3 direction is this one here. Um, and there's also a reflection. So this look, so this is T1, T2, T3, T4, and then you're back to T5. And so it winds around like this. Um, but then you also need one reflection in order to get the remaining points here. And that's just uh, called the initial point X. Yeah. So if we do this, then um, uh, we have some flexibility. Yeah. We want to see we can move this a little bit. We can move X a little bit. We could move alpha a little bit. We could um, even a bit stronger or a bit less strong. We could we could change a a little bit. We could step further or not so fast. So I would like to say the admissible set here should be those parameters of the shift of the angle under x, which do not destroy the nearest neighborhood structure. So you can do a little bit, but you cannot do it too bad, so that you have new neighbors coming closer than the original ones. So that's just a, a small open set. And then as an interaction potential, I'm choosing something which is happy if the nearest neighbors are exactly at one and the preferred bond angle of, of 120 degrees. So that's the basic um, carbon, carbon light um, um, uh, potential. Now, if I do this, um, then um, let's do this now for a very specific uh, example. That's a so-called 5-2 nanotube. So you, how do you do these carbon nanotubes? You, you roll out, so that's from Wikipedia here, you roll up um, a graphene sheet, and then you try to roll it up into certain directions. There are two easy directions. When you go like uh, in the axis, a parallel to the axis, like this one would be a zigzag configuration. This one would be the, uh, the armchair configuration. They have been analyzed, in fact. Um, um, but sort of what seems to be open so far is to, to really do cases which go um, which go uh, in, in general, like for example, this case here. Yeah? So something you wind up in a direction which is gives, gives a certain chirality to the number uh, to the number field. Now, if we do this and we simply roll up and see what happens, then we see well, not even this is satisfied. It's not even a critical point for our potential. So if you do it in a naive way, you simply roll up graphene, it will not be in a stable equilibrium because even the first order test uh, does not, that fails, yeah? But um, what we can do is we can try to minimize out these A and alpha and X and see if we get something better. And that's true. If you take the energy of this configuration and you take something which is locally minimizing out this under this guy, then we do get critical points. Now, um, the interesting part is that you can also stretch the nanotube a little bit. So this means you, change, you choose an A, which is bigger than the optimal configuration here, and then you have a nanotube under stretch. And it turns out, if we now apply all this machinery to our, uh, to our setting, then we find that this will be a stable configuration. So here you stretch the nanotube a little bit, and then A representation set. So the set P only has one element. It's this guy here. So the associated space group is G H. It's exactly like this. And there's the associated fundamental domain. And then if you compute everything like this, if you compute really the um, uh, stability 
a constant seal, you get this picture here. So that's stable, that's positive, that's in the extended, uh, in the tensile regime of a nanotube. Here it's negative or even minus infinity in the, in the lower part, it's not stable. And this is for the critical part, even what happens uh, really if you try to, to minimize on dependent of the fundamental, of the single fundamental domain here, and then you will see the onset of the instability when you are at the at this uh, at this particular uh, elongation of the nanotube. Okay, and uh, with this, I would like to close. Thank you very much for your attention.